Let's see. Can you hear me? Yeah. Amazing. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the center. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my name is Glenda Testone. I am the executive director of the center. I am the first female executive director of the center. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been here for, this will be the 14th year. Um, and I am also a really proud feminist, um, really proud queer woman, um, and just really happy to be in a room like this. It gives me hope. Um, at a time when we are uh, banning books, we have over 400 pieces of anti LGBT legislation in the first three months. Oh, I don't know. It's like an echo. <laughs> um, so it's not often uh, that you get to, and we were just having a little chat in the back about generations and older generations, younger generations. Um, it feels like the more things change, the more they stay the same and sometimes go backwards. And so to have an evening like tonight um, where we can welcome and honor an icon uh, like <laughs> is huge. Um, you don't often get to thank the people on whose shoulders you stand um, but tonight I do. So thank you, Rita Mae Brown. Um, I wouldn't be here, you know, uh, without women like you that came before me. So thank you for everything, truly. And we're going to fight like hell to make sure we get all the rights back that we deserve and even more. Um, before I introduce our two incredible speakers, I know you came here to see them, not me, so I'll get out of the way in a second. Um, I did just want to say this is an incredible turnout, um, and for anyone who is interested in getting more involved in the center, we would love to have you. We have an incredible um, events like this, at least on a monthly, if not weekly basis, so check out the calendar. And we have an annual event every year that honors um, specifically women in our community. It's called our Women's Event. It's in November. It's awesome. Um, if you haven't been or you haven't been for a while, check it out. I think this year it is, it's gonna be on a Friday night. So it's gonna be a wild time. Check it out. <laughs> it's on our website. Okay, putting on my glasses, formally introducing these two incredible women. Um, so first, Felice Cohen. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's here for Felice, surrounded by amazing women. Um, Felice is known nationally and internationally as the woman who lived in one of the world's smallest apartments. That is something to be known for. I couldn't do that. Um, Felice Cohen is the award-winning author of the best-selling books, Half In, a coming-of-age memoir of forbidden love, and 90 Lessons for Living Large in 90 Square Feet or More, and what Papa told me. <clears throat> the YouTube video of Felice in her former 90 square foot New York City apartment has over 25 million views. She's been featured on Good Morning America, NBC, CBS, NPR, Time, The Globe and Mail, New York Daily News, Forbes, and The Daily Mail, and more. She speaks around the country about how living tiny made her life as large, her life larger, as well as offering tips on organizing and decluttering. Do you make house calls? <laughs> I have a child, she's four, it's hard. Um, <laughs> uh, Felice's book, What Papa Told Me, was endorsed by Aaliyah, uh, uh, sorry, Aaliyah Weisel and Yad Vashem, and, in Jerusalem, and it's taught in schools across the country, has been translated into Polish, and has sold around the world. As a Holocaust educator, she has spoken to over 25,000 students and adults around the United States. All this 
from a book that she wrote as a gift to her grandfather. So please welcome Felice. And now Rita Mae Brown is the New York Times bestselling author, pioneering LGBT rights activist, and Emmy-nominated screenwriter who has more than 70 books in a variety of genres and nine television shows and films. From her groundbreaking coming-of-age novel, Ruby Fruit Jungle, <laughs> changed my life, <laughs> thank you, to the popular long-running Mrs. Murphy slash Sneak Pie Brown murder mystery series, Mrs. Brown, Ms. Brown has been long delighting audiences for over five decades. She started life in an orphanage in Philad Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and went on, oh, let's hear it for Pittsburgh, sure, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and went on to receive degrees in classics and English from NYU, a doctorate in political science, and a certificate in cinematography from the School of Visual Arts. Well at NYU, Ms. Brown co-founded the Student Homophile League and began working for the National Organization for Women. However, she was thrown out after confronting President Betty Friedan about Friedan's anti-gay remarks and the organization's attempts to distance itself from lesbian membership. Thank you, Rita. In response to her expulsion, Ms. Brown founded a group called the Lavender Menace. Yeah, let's embrace that. Um, and played a lead role in the zap of now's signature event, the Second Congress to Unite Women, where Brown and others called attention to the plight of lesbians and also black and working women. Months later, now passed a resolution establishing lesbian rights as a legitimate concern for feminism. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Brown also co-founded the Furies Collective, a Washington, D.C. lesbian separatist community, which was the first lesbian landmark to be included in the National Registrar of Historic Places. Ms. Brown worked for many years as a writer in Hollywood for Norman Lear, Aaron Spelling, Roger Corman, among others, and she has served on the Primetime Emmys Awards Committee and still votes. She is a New York Public Library Library Lion and has served as a member of the National Endowment of the Arts Literary Panel and as a judge for the Penn International. In, a, in addition, I know it's amazing, right? <laughs> Very impressive. I'm almost running out of breath, but I'm almost done, I promise. Um, she received several Emmy nominations, won a Writers Guild of America Award, and was the recipient of the Pioneer Award for Lifetime Achievement at the 2015 Lambda Literary Awards. An animal lover and humane hunter, Brown is a master and huntsman of the Oak Ridge Fox Hunt Club, where they chase the scent rather than kill the foxes. She lives outside Charlottesville, Virginia on a 600 acre farm. Let's hear for Charlottesville. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> uh, on a 600 acre farm with her many cats, dogs, and horses. We are really honored to be here tonight um, with Rita May and with Felice, and I am overjoyed to welcome them to the stage. Please give them a big round of applause. Before we begin, um, thank you, Glenda. Uh, thank you, Richard Morales, uh, Greg Newton from the center, and all the staff and volunteers who've helped put this event together. I'm sure you're going to be excited not to get my emails every day anymore. Um, thank you all for coming. I had a dream last night that eight people showed up, and I wasn't <laughs> sure what I was going to do with all the wine. Um, especially, I'd like to thank uh, my family and my parents coming all the way from Cape Cod. Um, my <laughs> Uh, my parents have supported me in everything I've done, and 
They just celebrated their 55th wedding anniversary this month. Uh, they have been all in from the beginning. Um, and we have cake to celebrate. But the one person I really want to thank is up on the stage with me. You know, I have been getting asked for months, how did you get Rita Mae Brown to do an author talk with you? And I said, what, like it's hard? <laughs> um, and in fact, it really wasn't hard. All I did was change the spelling of her name. Now, Rita Mae spells it M-A-E, but I spell it M-A-Y because I first called her up at the beginning of the pandemic and I said, Rita, may I use your poems in my book? And she said, yes. So months later, I called her again and I said, Rita, may you consider endorsing my book? And she said, yes. So last fall, I figured, hey, I'm two for two. I'm gonna call her again. <laughs> and I said, uh, Rita, may you be interested in doing an author talk with me? And, and you know what her answer was. Um, you know, writing is a solitary endeavor, and one of the things Rita May has written about in her books on writing is that some authors and writers turn to drinking. Well, that's, that's not my thing. My thing is support from family and friends, and having someone whose writing you've admired for years stand there in your corner is a huge confidence booster, and I'm lucky that I have Rita May in my corner, not only as a mentor, but as a friend. So. Thank you again for coming, and thank you, Rita May, for doing this for thank me. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? It yeah, works. It is. Okay. Can you hear me without it? Good. No. No. Use it. Use it. Then you still got to yeah. do it. All right. <laughs> would you Would you like to start by telling us your pronoun? <laughs> I, well, we d we were laughing about this, but as you know, it's Monday Thursday for those of you that. Uh, keep the holidays, and for those of you that like the Divine Comedy, this was the day the Divine Comedy started. Um, so I feel that, you know, I should be addressed as Her Holiness. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's time for a female pope. Anyway, but we, we have a lot of fun, but it, I mean, it is, the, it is the beginning of one of the great journeys of literature, truly. And I'm, I'm just delighted to be here on Maundy Thursday. With you. Yeah, well, we've been having fun. Yeah, we have. Um, <laughs> so, you know, congratulations on the 50th anniversary of Ruby Fruit Jungle. I mean, it's, it's still so relevant today. It's a huge milestone. You know, you've told me um, that you don't look at Ruby Fruit as, a, as other people look at it. You look at it differently. And you want to tell us, you know, what do you think made it such a big hit? I haven't a clue. <laughs> I mean, I really haven't a clue. I. I was suffering from estrogen poisoning. Um, the women's movement was not a fun place to be uh, when in the early days of the women's movement. Everybody was morally pure, which, granted, it might be wonderful, but it can be tedious. It can be tedious. You can be too good. Um, and I just wanted, as we say down south, I just wanted to cut a shine. Come on, let's have some fun, for God's sakes. If we're going to be oppressed, we might as well laugh about it. Um, so I sat down and wrote Ruby for Jungle to entertain myself more than anything. So I look at the book as, okay, I had, this was my first novel. I'd written books before that and poetry. So to me, it's I had to choose between first person and third person. So I look at it technically. I had no idea you all were going to read it. I hadn't a clue, but thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then people started coming up to me, and not, not all of these <laughs> encounters were pleasant, but nonetheless, I began to realize there really is a world out there, and nobody has written about this in a positive way. I mean, at the end of the gay books, books everybody commits suicide. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, don't I mean, I murder, yes, suicide, no, <laughs> but that's me. <laughs> Well, I know 50 years ago when the book came out, it was banned, and yes. now it's banned again. Yes. And I know you had, <laughs> I wish my book would be banned. That helps sales, doesn't well, it? Well, it's like somebody put the, the film of history on backwards. I mean, it's amazing what's happening, and yet some of it makes sense. If you really think about it, you can see the signs. And we, we were talking about it earlier. I was talking with uh, Emily Forland and Emma Patterson, my two agents, and we've, we've been together a long time. Young though they are, we've been together a long time because when I met them, they were, well, they were in their early 20s with Wendy Weil. And any, but I said, you know what happened is because we did make it easier, the young forgot they had to keep fighting. 
I mean, they thought they were entitled to all these things. Yeah. Folks, every one of you in this audience is still not entitled to the Constitution. We have to fight. Every generation has to fight. It doesn't just belong to some of us. It belongs to all of us. So I don't care if you're a white male who's institutionally oppressed, if you're oppressed because of color. Fill in the blank. You have to fight. Nobody's really going to give you that constitution because it is truly a revolutionary document. You know, what other women and men influenced you when you were young? I know you said Alexis Smith was a big influence in kind of getting out of politics and finishing your book. L among the living, I would have to say Alexis Smith, Blue Mattrell, the great Greek professor at NYU who was one of my professors, Iris Love, uh, uh, the archaeologist who just passed away in 2020. And they all helped me in the sense that in their own ways they all said, don't go into the academy. I mean, I was getting my PhD, it means piled higher and deeper. Um, <laughs> and they said, you have something different. Don't get trapped in this kind of environment where people will kill one another over how Yates used a semicolon. You, you don't want that life. And, um, and Alexis had lived through it before because she was 51 when we met. And they were, it was Follies. It was when Hal Prince did Follies. And uh, Yvonne DiCarlo, they were, all, they were great. They were so wonderful to me. But I got to say, they all said, get out, kid. Get out. And so I did. I figured they know more than I do. I mean, to think they took their time for somebody that had holes in her sneakers. I had to walk all the way up to the Winter Garden. I couldn't even afford the fare. And I would stand outside the stage door. And finally, this guy that took care of the stage door told them there was this hungry kid out there, there every night. And so they brought me a sandwich. And that was how this friendship started. I don't know if it could happen today, but I want to think it could. Which is funny, because yesterday you were starving, and I brought you I a sandwich. I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. <laughs> she ate that down really fast. Um, <laughs> I know with the success of Ruby Fruit, Hollywood came calling. And do you have stories from, I know you wrote on Good Times and I Love Liberty. The electronic media is a very unique business. It's new. I mean, if you think about it, it's new. And it's devoted totally to profit, which unfortunately now, I mean, I guess every business is, but publishing too has become more like the electronic media than the old days of publishing when I was young. And it was just wide open. I mean, really wide open. Uh, but you go out there and you know what your job is. Your job is to shut up and do your job, really. And, uh, and so I did, and I didn't drink, and I didn't smoke, and I didn't take drugs, and I showed up on time. So I was really quite valuable. <laughs> but I saw, and in the people you feel closest to as a writer are actors because they make your ideas flesh. And you really are, in some ways, the same people. Actors and writers are both thieves of souls. We're stealing people all the time, in a way, and embodying them and making them real. And I loved it. And there's nothing as exciting as being on a big soundstage on the back lot of 20th Century Fox when it goes dark, the lights hit, and of course they don't use it anymore, but you hear the clacker, click. I mean, it is thrilling, and the people are thrilling, but more and more, even when I was there, it began to change, and production values really took over great stories. I mean, yes, the Transformers is wonderful, but... <laughs> I mean, there's an audience for that, and they tend to be 12-year-old boys. They deserve their stuff, but we deserve our stuff, and that's a real struggle now. Well, did, what was it like writing in a writer's room with a bunch of people as opposed to writing books all by yourself? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, but I, I wasn't intent on a big career. So if you weren't careful, you could wind up with knives in your back. I mean, which is unfortunately very true of the media. I mean, you have to choose your friends wisely, and you're going to work with people who will, you know, they would steal the pennies off a dead man's eye. Um, and so, so you better figure out who's who. And, and sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. Fortunately, I worked with very good people. But I knew I wasn't going to stay. It's not my world. Were you writing books at the same time while you were yeah. out there? Yeah, oh, I'm always writing. I mean, I, it's like breathing to me. I don't think about it. I mean, other people think about it and they worry. And, oh, am I doing this right? Am I, I don't care. If you don't like it, you won't buy it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to do it. That's good. Well, yeah. you just did it. I mean, who edited? Yeah. Why did you let your father edit uh, half in? 
Yeah, so one of my early editors was my father. Um, if you haven't ever had your father edit some of your sex scenes, try it. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I think that's why I, I added humor into some of those scenes because, you know, I had to read it in the same room while he was going at it with a red pen, marking it up, but um, it was fun. I mean, it Please was now, let me get this clear. You mean sex isn't funny? I was funny for me. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> here's the deal, folks. I'm going to really give it to you. And this is so true. Believe me. If you make love to a man, you can make love to any man in the world. You make love to a woman, it doesn't do you a damn bit of good with the next one. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> Women are difficult. They're complicated. Men are simple and wonderful. All you have to do is walk into the room. <laughs> You know that's true. I do. I hey, I've yeah, exactly. Um, I'm glad this <laughs> I came up quick. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, you know, I've been told it's so brave of me to write this personal story and to write about sex and with my dad and everything. But I think there's a scale when it comes to bravery. You know, my I've written about my grandfather. My grandfather was brave. He survived the Holocaust, and my grandmother. And you know, I think you were brave. And I know you say you don't like to brag and talk about it, but when, the, when Ruby Fruit came out, you, you told me you were threatened, you were shot at, people threw food at you, and you said you were never scared. No, I wasn't. You just, not scared. I figure when the good Lord jerks my chain, I'm going. So I don't really care how I'm going, and if I live through those things, I'll keep living. I mean, I, people just seem so fear-driven now. I don't quite get it. Look, we're all going to die, so put the pedal to the metal and have a terrific time. You know, don't worry about your cholesterol level or all this crap. <laughs> Just go for it. And I, that, I mean, that's the way I live, but that's how I was raised, too. My mother certainly went for it, and so did Daddy. But um, it's not great to hear a gunfire to know it's coming at you. I mean, I will give it. I, I, that little tiny experience, because I've been shot at twice, um, made me realize in a whole new way what I owe men in combat. What I owe those people that were even in Vietnam, which is always presented to us in a way that, of course, is not attractive. But Korea, World War II, World War I, I mean, God bless those people. Yeah. Why do you think the book, I mean, I assume that's why they shot at you. Um, oh, yeah. But why do you think it incited that reaction from people? I think some people are more terrified of change than being brutal. I think Putin is giving us a pretty good example of that. Um, and what I was asking for was change, which is look at everybody as a human being. You know, okay, they're not who they sleep with. They're completely and totally individual. And you're trying to lump them. What is the first thing that all oppression does? It removes individuality. So our individuality was removed. And unfortunately, the far left is removing individuality. If you don't think and vote their way, you're not really black. You're not really gay. No, you're really an individual. And that's what you should be. That's what we're fighting for, for you to find what's unique about yourself. And every one of you is unique. I mean, we're all different in some ways. And, and what you love, can you do what you love? If not, can you figure out a way to do it on the weekends? I mean, really, um, I, that's all that matters to me. But that call for individuality was terrifying to those whose idea of self is based on the oppression of somebody else. You know, like if you're white, that's special. If you're white, you get sunburn. <laughs> I don't know how special it is, but it's a definitely adva an advantage. Being male is, a, is an advantage up to a point. All these things are an advantage up to a point. But there is also you, you who you are. And I don't, I mean, don't get hung up on these things because you're going to lose your life trying to meet other people's criteria instead of your own. I mean, is everybody in this room gay enough? I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> I just want to know who your date is. <laughs> I mean, I know, I love that you say never let your oppressor define you. And, and you said the reward con for conformity is that everyone likes you but yourself. And... You know, you have this confidence, you, you just don't care what people think. And I know you say you have dense muscles, you think it's thick skin, or what do you think created this confidence? 
and not caring what people I don't think. know. I, I mean, maybe being in, in the orphanage, though I don't remember, it just sort of allowed me not to give a damn what people thought. Um, and then I was adopted back into the family in the, quote, poor end, unquote. But um, <laughs> this is the good thing about it and the bad thing about it. To quote my mother, ah, yes, Rita May, often wrong, but never in doubt. <laughs> and I don't. I just do what I'm going to do. Have you thought of writing a sequel to Ruby Fruit? I think it would be a mistake. Um, because you, she's eternally young for you. And that's a moment in everybody's life when they step out and they try to learn who they are and they're trying to negotiate the world. And of course, when all of us came into the world, uh, we did have to realize at some point it didn't start when we came into it. And it, you have to fight your way into it. And there's anger and all that kind of stuff when you're young. And she fits into that. She's growing up. If I were to present her as a fully formed adult, she might do interesting things, but I don't think she would be as interesting. I, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I just don't think I could do Daughter of Ruby Fruit Jungle. <laughs> I know you love history. You love the Greeks. You love to study Latin. Is there another genre or form of writing you'd like to try aside from books? I would love to write a play or two. I don't think there's anything as demanding as live theater. I mean, the, if you really want to be an actor, that's where you cut it. Um, and it's so exciting to be in the same room with somebody who's living and breathing in front of you and embodying whether it's Richard III or whether it's, you know, I always think of Shakespeare, uh, Lady Macbeth, I mean, that kind of stuff. It's unbelievable. Or opera. Of course, I, I mean, I'm not going to write music. But these things just excite me so much. And I, I started in junior theater. OK, it's kid stuff. But that's where I learned to love it, you know? I just thought, this is the best thing in the world. But when I got here, I realized, uh, probably not. <laughs> you know, bit, well, already it was so difficult. I mean, I had a friend who produced a lot of plays and won a lot of Emmys. And she said to me, you know, I can explain to people why they're going to lose money in the theater, but I can't explain to them why they lose money in film. And I started to think about that. I thought, ah, she's got it. Um, you know, besides me, what other authors do you like to <laughs> read? <laughs> well, I like the Papa book enormously because it was in his words these horrors in his words without drama. Like, oh, pity me, this is the worst thing that ever happened to anyone. Makes it, well, makes you realize he really did live through it, but also it makes it much more effective. But I have, I, I always try to give a modern writer a chance. But when I realize they don't know Latin, it's harder. <laughs> no, it is. Latin is 60% of your language. So why would you want to write if you dispense with 60% of your tools. That's like a surgeon just w wiping off half of the tools on the tray. I mean, can you really handle a subordinate clause if you don't know Latin? Because it's not really Anglo-Saxon, which is the real base of our language. Can you, do you understand the subjunctive tense? We only have a few examples of it in English, but they're potent. If you're writing, you really better know how to use it because it's a terrific exposure of your character. Um, and I look at this stuff and I think, I could not get into college. Uh, I got, uh, my first year of college was 1962. If I didn't know Latin, it was a demand. So I had four years. I went all the way through it and then kept it up in college. And now they don't even have to know a language to get into a good liberal arts college. How do you even know who you are if you don't know another language? You think you speak English? You do not speak English. It speaks you. And you are limited because of it. You're given certain you know, things that you can't do in English, but you're given other things you can do that you can't really do in French. How do you know that if you don't at least learn something else? So that's my first thing is, do they really understand language? I don't look at the plot first. I look at, can they handle English? And unfortunately, so many can't. It's noun, verb, direct object. It's deeply disappointing, if you love English, to see the devolution of our tongue. Um, but, I mean, of course, Aristophanes. I always go back to Aristophanes. And, uh, and then I, you know, come forward. The restoration drama is my next favorite period. I mean, can you believe that stuff? It is the best. 
To this day, if you see Lady Teasel's screen fall down, you're going to scream in that audience. I don't care who you are. You're just going to scream. Of course, there she is, exposed. <laughs> but that, I, I mean, I, I sort of babbled on. But I try to read modern authors. I try to give them a chance. But I, I struggle because I want to say, do you love your language or don't you? I know. Carrie warned me not to have her go on the Greeks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I know you talk about Toni Morrison. I know she was a friend of yours and how her books... I owe Toni my, my National Endowment of the Arts grant before I was asked to sit on the committee by President Carter. Um, she fought for me because they threw Ruby for a Jungle in the trash. Clearly, these were not gay people on the board. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think Toni was the only black person, and that was revolutionary. Um, but she was a classics minor at Howard. And of course, I was classics at NYU. So when I learned what she did for me, I wished to thank her. It was years later because I didn't know. You know, people sort of kept it a secret because I guess it was not a very good chapter for the National Endowment. And uh, so I thanked her. And you would think, oh, you're going to talk about politics. You're going to talk about feminism. You're going to talk about race. Hell no, we talked about Thucydides. We were so excited. I mean, she loved it. But I see it in her work, too. And you would say, oh, no, no, no. She's totally American. She knows her stuff, honey. You read it again. This is a lady that really knows her stuff. I loved her. I know. That so many stories you had. You know, one thing we have in common is humor. Um, and you said, I'm funny, and funny people are dangerous. They knock down barriers. It's hard to hate people when they're funny. I try to be like Flip Wilson, Tyler Perry, and Leslie Jones, who help white people understand blacks through humor. One way or another, I'll make them laugh, too. Why do you think humor knocks people off their high horse? I think people are tired. I think they're set upon. If somebody laughs, you get a little burst of energy, and uh, it helps. It helps lower the defensiveness, and sometimes you can get through. I mean, think of Reagan. Some of you in here may have loathed him. He was funny. <laughs> he could really rip one off. And, and, and you, you had to like him even if you disagreed with his policies. But that's the way to get people on the bus. You know, you talk to them, you lower it down. And one of the things that I, I've always admired about gay men is they tend to have a terrific sense of humor. And sometimes they flaunt it in a very sort of Nelly way, what we would call Nelly in the old days. It's still funny, though, and it brings it down. And the straight guy who's a little nervous about his nether regions um, <laughs> can sort of enjoy it because, of course, he's never going to be that way. He's never going to be that feminine. And yet, there he is. I think it's great. Yeah. I mean, I wish I could be funnier. I mean, l who's better than Lily Tomlin, you know? Yeah, I know you wanted Lily. Originally, they were going to film Ruby for Jungle in the 70s, and you wanted Lily Tomlin yeah, to Lily play Molly. Lily would have been great. I mean, she's a genius. She, and her, she has the right partner in life, and the two of them together create a genius. I mean, it's really wonderful, she and Jane, but what a talent. God. But she would have been perfect because she, she's not beautiful, but she's attractive, you know, and she has that timing, that perfect timing, and you got to have good timing for Ruby Fruit. Uh, for sure. You know, well, here we are in New York in the West Village, and we're not far from where Stonewall was, and you just happened to be outside the bar on the night of the raid. How did, how did you find yourself there? I was there with a woman named Martha Shelley, which wasn't her real name. I have no idea what her real name was. <laughs> and we had come back from mimeographing, you know, political screeds that we would drop off at the gay bars. Well, that was the only way you could reach people then. And we're going through Sheridan Square, which of course has Phil Sheridan. And I won't tell you what I think of Phil Sheridan. That's different. But at any rate, um, <laughs> all of a sudden, there's this wild scream. And the Black Mariahs are coming down sixth. And you could hear them turn. And the, the, all of a sudden, they're in front of us. And we're just standing there like, what the hell is going on? And then these, you will have to forgive me. These were the words of the These wild scream queens come screaming out of this basement bar. They were fabulous. I mean, one of them was in drag. You couldn't have loved him more. And they start fighting the cops. And here are these cops, these big, you know, guys, with the, trying to beat these gay guys. And the gay guys are starting to beat the shit out of them. It was, it was ever so delightful. Of course, they did finally get dumped into the Black Mariahs. And, 
you know, there, there, uh, Bartha and I said, you know, we're the only two women in the middle of the first gay riot. So we got out. <laughs> but I loved it. I know when you first moved to New York, you lived in a vehicle. Uh, how an, was that? An old Hudson, black body, red top, on University Avenue at the corner of NYU. I had nothing. I, I had my kitty cat, um, Baby Jesus. <laughs> I thought the name would help me, you know. <laughs> She's still with me, actually. I have her ashes in a funerary urn. <laughs> and when I go down, we're going down together. The deal is you have to mix my ashes with baby Jesus. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and there was a, a young black man about my age in the front seat, a fellow called Calhoun. And we, beca you know, we became friends and we tried to get jobs. We'd go out and try to get jobs. And if anybody got a little bit, we shared it. And then I finally got a job waiting tables for which I am eminently ill-suited. Um, <laughs> but I got enough to get a $50 a, a week apartment, a cold water flat, and then he got a job. And then I never saw him again. Um, he was good looking. He was really good looking. And I often wonder if that was how he managed you know, because they're rent boys. And when, when you're that poor, you're going to do anything. Were you a student at NYU? No, I wasn't accepted yet. I mean, I finally did get accepted because I test well. I, I'm not really that smart, but I test great. And I had great board scores and all that kind of stuff. And I was captain of the tennis team and, you know, all the things they look for. And so they let me in and gave me a scholarship, but I had to take remedial speech because I had a southern accent, which was considered, well, you, you were considered stupid. I happen to think that's an advantage. Like I always say to young women, you're underrated, make use of it. <laughs> really, it's an advantage. Look at Angela Merkel. She was three miles down the road before those guys figured out what she did because they underestimated her. So girls, there you go. <laughs> I promised we'd mention fox hunting. Um, ah. And when I was down visiting you a couple weeks ago on your 600-acre farm at the base of the Blue Ridge Mountains, I mean, it was just a beautiful day. It was so much fun. Um, you know, you're a master of fox hound. How long have you been fox hunting, and what got you started in it? Well, I hunted in my mother's womb, my natural mother's womb. So it's really all that I know, and it's, it's my passion. I mean, if I had to pick between writing and fox hunting, I would pick fox hunting. I mean, I love writing, but I learned to communicate with animals before I learned our language. So that's the most natural thing to me. Um, and I love it. I love being outside. I love seeing the beauty of nature and how it all fits together. And I love the fact that it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how rich you are, doesn't matter whether you're male or fe female, you can either ride the horse or you can't. So it is a terrific equalizer. You can't bullshit your way through fox hunting. And I, and I like that because it creates real camaraderie and people like one another. I'm not expecting other people to like it because it's seen as a rich person's sport. It's really not, particularly in America. But um, what worries me is people are now so disengaged from nature. Like if I hear a bird call, usually I can tell you what that bird is saying because they're not saying the same thing just like you don't. There's the, hi, I'm here. There's the, get out of my space, you creep. There are all these different calls. There's the, hey, baby. <laughs> you know, that's a good one. <laughs> you know, and, and to know that, you're like, oh, is he saying that to me? <laughs> no, probably not, but that's okay. I know, and I, lo and I love it, and it gives me peace. I kind of think living here in any big city, it's like you're in the electric blender, and it's just all people going around and around and around, and there's no balance. I mean, I'm sure there can be, and I see it in an unfortunate way. But when I lived here, this was pretty much of a mess. It was Needle Park days. I don't ever hope that happens again. You know, I volunteer in Central Park once a week, and I've been finding needles up there. So, yeah, it's not fun when you find that. Um, you know, when I was visiting you after the hunt, we were driving around, and three of the hounds got lost. And it took us a while to get one of them in the back of the car. They're heavy. Yeah. Um, and then another one we found, and then another one didn't come back, you told me, for two weeks. Yeah. Did, but he, he came and showed right up. Did you ever want to run away when you were young? Well, I always thought I could provoke my parents to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd get the house. But yeah, sure, I thought about it. Doesn't everybody think about it? Like, oh, I hate you, I hate you, I'm going. You know, but uh, I, I was fortunate. I was raised, let me put it this way. My mother used to say to me, discipline is the greatest kindness. And I got a boatload of it, and by God, she was right. She really was. 
I know my little sister's here. She ran away once. Um, <laughs> she was 17, no, seven. <laughs> 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 then she got bored and came home. Um, <laughs> if you hadn't become a writer, what other profession do you think you would have wanted to Well, do? I would have loved to have been a huntsman, but I know that wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have been able to make enough money. I think I would have really loved being an investment banker and following money around the world. I mean, that is really pretty exciting when you think about it. And if there's a little blip in Singapore, how long before it comes here? You know, because you know, now we get tied tighter and tighter together with money. And uh, I mean, it always was. I mean, even in ancient Greece, money was traveling around the world. It traveled slower. But if there was a problem in uh, Corinth, you were going to get it too. And there were people that could follow that. But the other thing, the quick, one quick thing about ancient Greece, you know, of course, about Socrates and all this and that. And most of you are all bedazzled by Athens. If you're a woman, don't be bedazzled by Athens because you were arm candy there with the exception of Aspasia and a few people like that. If you were a Spartan, you were educated, you went to the gym, and your husband could be king of Sparta. When he crossed the threshold of the house, you ran the show, and that was it. You can say, well, there was a woman's sphere and there was a man's sphere. Yes, but you could read and write. You were physically fit. You could listen to them talk about politics if you so wish and didn't say anything, but you could talk to your husband after. It was much better to be a woman if you're a Spartan. So the whole Athenian gloss is really meant for men. And you're taught the Iliad and the Odyssey the way they taught it. The Iliad's not really about war. Two-thirds of it takes place back at the ships. It's about leadership. Read it again. The Odyssey is not about getting lost. The Odyssey is about the correct relationship between a man and a woman. Read it again. But you're not going to get taught that until there's more women classics professors like Iris Love or, or Blue Mattrell. And it drives me nuts that these great, fabulous works of art are taught to us in these narrow ways, which of course support patriarchy. And if I were a patriarch, I would try to support it. I get it. Nobody wants to give up power. But um, they're all a lot more complicated than you've been teaching. And there's a lot more gay love in them than you've been taught. I mean, it's not like this is new, folks. It's been going on for thousands of years. And it will go on for thousands of more. Yeah. Every discussion we have is like a, uh, a class. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's Can't okay. Help it. I know. I, I leave, every time I stop talking to you, I have a list of books I have to read. Um, Iliad, I'll read it, I will. <laughs> you know, as far as the writing process, are you one of those people you write the same time every day? I put a piece of paper down until blood appears on my forehead. <laughs> and then I know I'm ready to write. I don't worry about it. I'm not, a, obviously, clearly, I'm not a person that worries about anything. I mean, when you have the basis I have in Greek and Latin, why would you ever worry? You got what you need. Just sit down, shut up, and do it, you know, and hope you don't bore somebody else to death. Um, I, 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 I do it in the mornings in the winter because it's so cold, and then in the summer I do it in the afternoons. Uh, I, do, I go by the season, but yeah, I, I do about the same amount every day, and some days it's easy, and some days it's like, oh God, how did I get myself in this corner? How am I going to get out of this? Um, but it's fun because I get to do something different every day. I can't imagine sitting in a cubicle doing the same thing every day. I would lose my mind. I mean, and I know some of you probably, it's okay. You're getting paid a bundle and you'll do it. I would literally just lose my mind as well as my eyesight. Well, the reason you work in the morning sometimes in the winter and in the afternoon is because you're working on the farm. Yeah. I mean, you're doing everything on that farm. Yeah, a lot I am. That's why I'm not fat. I know we're not supposed to fat shame, but I fat shame a kitty in one of the books. I can't help it. <laughs> but here's the thing. Every extra pound you put on your body, your body has to create about a mile of capillaries to move the blood. Am I right, Catherine? Close. She's a doctor. She's an ER doctor. She was a flight surgeon, but she's an ER doctor. And I look at that and I want to say, what are you doing to your heart? If you don't care, the people who love you do. You know, get out and walk around a little. This from the person who weans herself every day on Coca-Cola. That's true. <laughs> I didn't say anything about nutrition. I just <laughs> talked to... <laughs> I love the Coke. 
I know you write a lot of the mysteries now. How do you get the ideas for these books? My mother said, honey, ideas are like bats. They just fly in and out of your head, and it's true. I have no idea. I just walk around, oh, there's a, that'd be a good story. And then there it goes. Like the one I just, that just came out yesterday, uh, what, I guess, no, two days ago, is about fentanyl. And when I wrote it, you know, I was doing all the research, and the statistics are already outdated. The problem has become that much worse. And I mean, I knew it was a problem. I knew I wanted to write about it. But I mean, I'm, I'm already late. I mean, it's a good story. I mean, I hope I can fool you up to a point. But I always try to put something in there that if you can learn if you want to. And if you don't, just learn, you know, just be taken away from your troubles. You don't need to, you don't, let, let me put it this way. Why court sorrow? There's enough of it. I mean, if you want to read about that, sorrow and misery, okay, I don't. Because I know it finds me, it finds you. I would prefer to get a little energy so I can fight it. What do you look for forward to every day? Well, I, I like to go to my house and I like to ride my horses. There's something about the rhythm of a horse that gets me going. Um, but I just look, I mean, I look forward to reading. I look forward to knowing what my friends are doing. I mean, here, look at this. Every one of you in this room knows something I don't. So that if I had the opportunity to be with you, I would learn something. I want to learn, you know? I mean, I want to learn how did you get through life? Um, when were you at the bottom? How did you pull yourself up? Because everybody hits the bottom in one way or the other. Well, here you are. Obviously, it didn't crush you. How did you do it? You know, those are the things I want to know because I really think we're here to sort of link arms and lift one another up and keep going. And one of the things I find distressing about today is so much of it, it's me, me, me. You know, how about you, you, you? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I know, she's never taken a selfie, which is good because we're all just looking at ourselves. Um, you know, you said that you mentioned the Divine Comedy. It's a poem about the spiritual journey of man through life. After your lives here, your years here on this earth, what do you think has been the most spiritual part of your journey? Well, I was raised high church Christian. And of course, remember it is Monday, Thursday. So I actually believe renunciation is the cocaine of Christianity. <laughs> and uh, I decided I wasn't going to go down that route. You know, I, I was going to embrace life, good, bad, and different. I was going to do stupid things. I was going to make mistakes. I did all of it. I did. I still am. Um, so every day is spiritual for me. But the most spiritual thing for me is I try to sit outside, even in the winter, and watch the sun set over the Blue Ridge Mountains because they're really blue, and they get bluer. And I just sit there and I think, those mountains are a billion years old. Those were the highest mountains on earth at one time. And you see these beautiful rounded shapes. And what you see is those mountains are sentinels to the power of time. And I'm nothing. I mean, I'm really nothing. I'm enjoying it. But who's going to remember me a billion years from now? Or you or all of you? We're all worried about stuff that doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is, are you good to the people you love? You know? Can you help somebody that needs it? What else is there to do? I mean, if you just want to be a big noise in your career, fine. You'll be a big empty noise when you die. Yeah. 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 Well, we, we also want to open it up to, um, I know, I figured the discussion might bring up some questions if anyone would like to have a comment or question. You said that you don't speak English. English speaks through you. That English tells you what to say. Is it possible that you could be referring to symbolic proto language besides English that enables you to make contact with what gives your books the power that it, they do? For instance, the, the same rhythm on that horse that you ride is the same rhythm that Xerxes' men felt when they attacked on horseback. There's a connection that is independent of English, of French, of German.
Can you can you repeat some of that? No. <laughs> well, I caught a bit about the rhythm, and, I, and I, you know, it's one of the things that I, the backbone of our culture is iambic pentameter. So that's the rhythm of life. It's not necessarily the rhythm of life, but it's the rhythm of our life. And then you read Horace, o lente, lente, corite, nocti, seque. It's a three-beat canter. Think of it. So once you really start looking at language in terms of rhythm, a whole new door opens up. Here's another way to look at it. How many of you have ever been on the phone because one of your goddamn devices, sorry to swear, screwed up, and so you ask for help and you get a person in India? And their English is perfect, but you can't understand it. It's a different rhythm. They haven't got iambic pentameter. And you're desperately trying to understand this, and you can't. I mean, I'm sorry I couldn't hear all of you said. But I, I think about rhythm a lot. I think, Well, I think about language. Obviously, it's my tool. But we are so cocky, and we are so limited. You know, and, th and the great thing about language is it expands your experience. And then maybe you can be more articulate in your own language. It is possible to be articulate in English if you work at it. But English can be really fuzzy. I mean, look at our verbs. Love. I love your shoes. I love your hair. I love you. What? In Greek, there's five different verbs for love. And you know exactly what they mean. And, and the subtleties in some of these other languages we don't have either. So for instance, uh, I don't know if you've ever read Plato's Symposium or this or that. But Xenophon wrote a lot about Socrates do, and there's one thing, th this gets you to English because you can't do this. Um, they're, they're talking about, he's talking about learning. And so the beginning of that verb is an N. And, and he's talking about suffering, and then he's talking about learning, and the beginning of that verb is basically an E. Well, the rest of the verb is the same. So what is the hit? To learn is to suffer. We can't do that. So you start dealing with these verbs, and you're absolutely blown away with what we can't do. But we can do other things. Noun, verb, direct object. I mean, we are the uh, language of aviation because it's the maximum amount of information in the minimum amount of time. Well, you've all mastered that for the most part. Uh, OK, maybe Biden has it and some of the others where they go on and on. And on. There's no politician that can't talk you to death. I don't care how much you like them. I mean, they'll dig their graves with their mouths, all of them. But I look at this and I just think, and people don't know. They don't know. It just makes me, it, it kind of makes me sad because all of your knowledge is not being tapped. I mean, you're not tapping it. I'm, 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 I don't mean to insult anyone, but I just mean there's a lot in you that you can't get out. And so what do you do as an English speaking person? You repeat yourself and you raise your voice. <laughs> but that, that's not, what works? Often that drives people away, especially when men start mansplaining to women. Women just turn right off. Seems to be a two-way street sometimes. Um, any any other? Yes. Do you paint or draw? Do I? Well, Do you paint or draw? I used to draw as a child, and then. Um, the, the woman that adopted me destroyed all my paints and all that because that's what my natural mother did. And she was afraid I would turn out like my natural mother, who was a crack athlete. Um, but uh, I like it. I'm visual. Obviously, I'm very visual. And I envy artists tremendously because all you have to do is walk and look at it. You have to take time to read me. And if I don't, and now, if I don't catch you in the first chapter, I've lost you. It didn't used to be that way. You used to have time. And you don't have time now. And publishing, Publishing, obviously, is switching to that. And um, one quick thing about publishing. Um, I keep hearing that audiences have changed. And I believe they have. But my audience hasn't changed. You are you. Some of you I've known a long time. So my audience is not being served. And that's very frustrating to me. I'm not alone. I mean, John Grisham lives 10 miles away from me. And ba David Baldage, there's a lot of us in Virginia. I mean, we're all saying the same thing. We're all frustrated. But publishing has changed. It's now just another giant corporation. Not the little houses. Not some of the ones like Gray Wolf and Riverhead and, you know, I forget, Soho Press and some of the little ones. But the big ones are just great big juggernauts. 
You know, if you're going to turn them a buck, they'll, they'll publish you, but they might not take the time to develop you like they did in the past. And then if you get old, I'm 78, I'll be 80 in 2024, uh, you're just discounted. And, and, and what you're interested in is no longer interested in them because you're not cutting edge. Who the hell do you think got them here? You. I mean, a lot of you don't take credit for what you did. You fought. You vote, you go out, you do community work, you work for the MS Foundation, you do all kinds of things. You know, I, 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 it, it upsets me that you're just shoved aside. Well, it upsets me that I get shoved aside, but I at least get the opportunity to kick ass, <laughs> which I do. <laughs> I know you just, uh, you're, you know, renewing your contract with your agent and stuff, and you've been with Random House. Do you want to try to go to a smaller publisher? You think you get more? Attention? I don't know. I mean, that's down the road. What I know is it's not fun anymore, guys. It used to be so much fun when you had people like, you know, Jack Romanos at Simon and Schuster and Linda Gray. Oh my God, she had a cigarette staple to her lip. <laughs> the president, and you'd go in there, and Linda with red lipstick, you know, and then the the red lipstick, but she, well, she started as an editor, so of course as a writer you love talking to her. And most of the editors that you worked with knew Latin, they knew literature, they loved literature. You could sit down and talk about Shakespeare's King John and why, did you think it failed or did you think it was a success? They knew, they knew, they don't know now. It, it, it's not, it's not their fault. We have cynically abandoned our young. Our schools are terrible and there's no other way to put it. We've just Junk these kids. And basically, we're telling them, you're not smart enough to learn this. Well, hell, people have been learning it for thousands of years. Of course they're smart enough to learn it. You're just too lazy to teach them. And then, the te then you don't pay teachers. Of course you're going to get a teacher's union. And they're going to fight for their jobs. They're not necessarily going to fight to educate you. But I think people are called to education, and those are the ones getting screwed. I'm sorry, I'm blabbing on. And there's a person back there. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Judy, and I have read your book just recently, and I fell in love with it. And oh, yes. why, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, why people like it, but the infectious um, uh, quality, the realness of meeting two people. And I asked my question is, when you said, you know, you make love with a man, and it's like, well, oh ma'am, you've done it all. And when you do that with women, I was really intrigued by you saying, make love with one, you can't make predictions about the next. And I'm just kind of curious, given your sort of exuberant sort of love of life and ability to kind of capture nuances, why you would say that? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I actually think every one of you sitting here looking at me has a book in you. You've got at least one book in you. You may not write it. You may not take yourself seriously enough to write it. But if you don't write it, can you at least do it for your children and your grandchildren if you have them? Let them know what you've lived. Let them know what you've seen. You know, let them know the decisions you made that were right and wrong. We all make stupid decisions. Um, and, and before I forget, there was a question back there. Hi, um, well, my name's Dana. Um, I started a queer book club just before the pandemic, and the first book we read was yours. So it's very exciting to be here, and I'm here with my friend from book club. Um, we're, we still meet every month. One thing we've noticed in the books we read is that not every single book is a perfect piece of literature in terms of um, the things you talked about, like the English language, the way that grammar is used, whatever, you know, those fancy things. I'm wondering when, when we are reading literature from, or stories from groups that don't typically have access to like the kinds of institutions that some of us, I, I did, I went to university, but how do we make sure that we can value the story that's being told without being distracted by the format or the platform it's being told on? 
Even if you're not educated, you have you, the first decision you have to make if it's fiction is first person or third person. So no matter what, you have to make the same decisions. You just not have the context of literature that those of us who have been to university have. And those stories, I think, are beginning to come out more as visual stories. Uh, like Tyler Perry, it's visual. But those are stories. I mean, I know what those women are like that he's doing. I grew up with those women. And so for much of what we have now, the information is visual, which is why they are so easily misled. Because the eye is your primary sense. So for instance, some of you may remember, but most of you have seen the uh, political ad when Goldwater was against, uh, was it LBJ? Yeah, it was LBJ. And the ad was the kid picking the daisy and the bomb in the background. Was it true? No. Would Goldwater have instituted a nuclear war? No. He was one of the finest figures we had. And LBJ was one of the most effective figures we had. But everybody was horrified, scared the poop right out of him. Well, LBJ won in a landslide. So you are misled by your visual sense why all of these sophisticated things now, like remember the time they made a, 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 a whatever you call it, a blog, a podcast, whatever, uh, that made uh, Nancy Pelosi look drunk? She wasn't. So there's going to be more and more of this. And you're going to have to be able to figure it out, which you all can. But can a 12-year-old? They don't have the life experience. They don't have, so they are very easily misled. And I don't know what we do about it. I'm not sure passing a law makes any good. I mean, we've passed laws since BC, and we're still killing one another very effectively. <laughs> if, if there, is, is there anything else? Because, OK. Yes. I would like to hear um, what you have to say about the ancient Greeks and how it applies to us. Uh, you, but you do you want me to concentrate on Xenophon? Well, Xenophon was a, a, a general who lost a battle. I mean, he, he actually did a lot of great things, but he ultimately had to get people to the sea. And the word for sea is thalassa. And they had to go across the desert. It was amazing how this guy saved all his troops. And when they see the sea, they fall down on their knees and they're all weeping and saying, Thalassa, Thalassa. But he, he was harmed in his career for losing a battle as though those running Athens. You all think Athens is great. Remember they drove Socrates to suicide. They were not that great. Nobody's that great. But anyway, um, so they dumped him. And that's how we got his version of Socrates. But also, he built a temple to Artemis, and he was a terrific huntsman. So he wrote about hounds and everything. He wrote his true today. He wrote about horses. He's very likable. I mean, you read some of these people, and you like him. But he's also brilliant. And you understand the mechanism of power never changes. The people change. Power doesn't change. It's amoral. The people who hold it, you hope, are moral. But this is one of the reasons why institutionally, li institutionally lied, oppressed groups are so, they, they didn't grow up with power. They don't know how it works. So they take to the streets long before they should. That's the last thing you do. That's not the first thing you do. And so they're losing. They're losing. And that's one of the reasons this film of history is going backwards. And again, because it's visual stuff. You can outrage per people. You can take down all the statues in the world. It's not going to change a thing. But if you took that energy and money and you got kids a good education, you would really be able to change things. Those kids would understand the process by which you protest in America and why destruction is the last thing you do. But everyone whom you are trying to change has to realize on one level or another that you can hurt them. Power always involves pain. And if you deny that, you'll never have any. Women don't want to face it. Women want to be nice. I mean, I remember with Betty, who was, could be pretty cruel. I said, Betty, you're like Lennon. You want a great review in the St. Petersburg Times. That's not the way it works. Well, she hated me, obviously. But uh, she called me a redneck. And I remember once saying, yeah, well, this redneck reads Greek and Latin. What about you? You know? <laughs> it was good. It was good. But anyway, so be it. She was anti-lesbian and this and that. But I'll give her credit. 
She apologized years later on a stage in Marin. She didn't apologize to me personally, but she said I was wrong. That was as good as it was going to get. But I look at this and I think we, we have to realize, but particularly women, because you're raised to be sweet, you're raised to be kind, you got to learn to hurt people. You don't have to knock their teeth out their throat, but you can cost them their job. You can make their company lose money if you get enough of us together. If you can inflict pain, people will suddenly take you very seriously. Otherwise, you're just chopped chicken liver. I mean, it's cruel, but it's the truth. I mean, look what those women did in San Francisco, the Asian women who are always seen as these beautiful, tiny, little, perfect Asian women. Uh, and they are beautiful. There's certainly no question about that. But they fought back. Finally, they got rid of these people that were totally screwing their schools. And everybody's like, what? Asian women? What? I'm like, yeah, and I hope there's millions more. You go, girls. <laughs> I mean, really, I was so excited. I, can't, I mean, I love it when people finally wake up and say, oh, this is how it works. Mm, it does. You know, Rita Mae doesn't own a computer, probably has never Googled anything. This is all just... In her head, you were like pre-Google. Well, I'm old. I've seen a lot. I don't need to Google it. You retain it. it. <laughs> you know? But again, I keep coming back to you. Each of you has more power than you have realized. Based on what you know, based on your friendship circles, based on what you're willing to do. And I will bring you to one of the things that worries me the most now. I'm not worried about our daughters. I'm worried about our sons. The messages we're giving boys... Um, it's, it's testosterone poisoning. Well, I don't know, honey. I've seen a lot of estrogen poisoning. So I think we need to rethink a lot of this. They're bigger and they're stronger and their mammalian function is to protect and defend. In other words, men die first. And that is what they have to do. You don't if you're a woman. You may die to protect your children and if it gets bad, yes, you'll go out and fight. But he has to do it. If he doesn't do it, there's no society. So are you going to punish a kid for beating up somebody that was ugly to his sister? I mean, again, I come from a different world. I'm a farmer. So I'm pretty basic. But I, I fear for our sons terribly. I do. I mean, they are bigger and stronger. How can you deny it? Personally, I'm thrilled. You do it, honey. <laughs> you know? Is that bad? <laughs> Is it bad to dump it on them? It's too bad you don't have any opinions. <laughs> um, <laughs> are there any other questions or comments or thoughts? If, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, do I have another book I'm working on? Yes, I'm actually working on uh, two. Um, you know, I'm a minimalist. I did live in a tiny space. One thing I did save is every letter I've ever been sent since I was little, from exes, from family, from friends, from famous people, and I've been putting them all together in, I'm calling it a reverse memoir, so you're reading about this person, but you never hear from this, this person. Felice, tell them about the crazy books. <laughs> no, do tell them. The fancy tales? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wrote a line of fancy tales, and they are modern day takes on the, the fairy tales we all know. Cinderella, I did uh, She's a Fella. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's a, a Doc Martin instead of a glass slipper, uh, Peter Pansy, um, and they've been illustrated. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that, that's fun. It's, it's oh, they're just great. fun that we get to do this. You know, if we're here together, can we talk for one minute? I mean, I don't know how long we have, and I don't want to inflict everything on you, although, I'll, you know, I'll do as much as I can. I don't really expect any of you to agree with me. I'm thrilled if you do, but I expect you to think for yourself and go out and fight. What the hell? You're an American citizen. You know, this, this isn't Russia. You're not going to be thrown in jail. Do it. You know, you got to do it. But we are at a time when, and let me just step back. I think the word trans is wrong. I think we are looking at this in a very superficial way, all of us, because our culture can be very superficial. But these people are really getting knocked hard. And some of them are kids and they're confused and they're just getting beat up. If we can, among ourselves, begin to look at this in a larger frame, every one of you looking at me has had a moment, and probably quite a few, 
where you said to your friends, well, my head tells me this, but my heart tells me that. But you figured out how to integrate reason with emotion. Well, what are the other two things you have to integrate? Spirit, which we do not want to talk about. We're only going to talk about spirit if it is dogmatically organized. We're terrified of it. So I won't talk about it, but I think that's a whole other discussion. There is no way your mind can encompass everything in the world and reality. And to me, there are other dimensions, and we can only sort of grasp at them and get moments. But you've had those moments. Every one of you has had some moment you can't explain. So that's spirit. So that we, we can't talk about. And then your body is the last thing. You have to integrate all of these things to become a functioning adult. Well, you have. It doesn't mean it's always easy. But we're, we're focusing on the body because it's easy. That's what you can see. You can't necessarily see spirit. You can sometimes see reason, and you can certainly feel emotion. But it's all focused on something that takes a long time to learn to work with it. I mean, look at you. How long did it take you to understand your body? It's not so easy. And to, to force people or for them to feel, well, I'm in the wrong body, I think some of them are. I'm not doubting it. But it, it takes time, and people need support. They need to hear all of us say, well, you know, it's kind of hard to get all this together. And I remember when I shot up from 5'2 to 6 feet, I stumbled over everything. You know, reach out. Try to help. Try to think what you did. And maybe we can take some of the onus off of this so these kids aren't getting the crap beat out of them in schools and laws passed against them. I mean, do I think you jam hormones down a six-year-old's throat? Well, of course I don't. But we've got to somehow make this open for all of us so whether you feel you're pro or con, we can come forward. But you have to look at yourself first. How did you do it? You all had to do it. So, you know, I guess you can't touch kids anymore. I would have said, put your arm around. That's what Arthur Ashe taught me. He said, you've got to touch children. If Arthur were alive today, he'd be horrified because you can't. He did a thing called Virginia Heroes. Arthur was really fabulous. Um, tennis, so that's how I know Arthur because we all started out together. I met him at the Orange Bowl when I was a teenager. And he said, we, we did this thing where we got fifth graders and we would all have to talk to them. And... Um, we were supposed to be successful. But anyway, he said, Rita Mae, when you go around the table, you make sure to teach, you touch every child. Touch them. That they understand. And that's reinforcement. And so every hour you'd get a different group of kids. Well, you couldn't do it today. But, you know, this kind of, so if you can't touch them, at least you can verbally support the kid and say, it is confusing. You will cry. You will get hurt. That's life. But don't be so quick to make decisions now. Live a little. Is that so difficult? Is that so difficult to tell people? Or is it wrong? I mean, I, I, I think we've got to do something to introduce support, but also, look, what would you have done, girls? What would you have done at age 11? Especially if you were a tomboy. <laughs> would you not have chosen to be a boy? And are you not glad you didn't do it? I mean, we got to get this out. I, I mean, maybe that's not what you want to hear from me, but I hate seeing these kids hurt. And I hate seeing these lawmakers making careers out of other people's pain. What a cheap goddamn shot that is. Oh, yeah, you, you should do that. What about my book, Half In? Yes. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so uh, when I was 23... Um, I had an affair with my boss, who was a 57-year-old woman, and I kept it a secret for almost 30 years. Uh, and I had a lot of shame behind that. And I finally, during the pandemic, when I was home, I had, you know, just was my, with my parents, and they were accepting, and they were supportive, and I said, why am I ashamed of anybody else if my parents are accepting of me? And it was a way for me to finish telling the story. I had started writing it um, as therapy, and it has now kind of taken on a life of its own. And being on the other side of that, telling the truth about something that's so painful uh, is, has been the best 
uh, therapy for me and um, helping other people write their memoirs and trying to you know, heal yourself through telling your story is, is so effective. And um, you know, I've been very lucky and very fortunate to be able to do that. Well, I'm old. Don't you want to ask how I've stayed so young? <laughs> I know, I watched you hauling sacks of hay <laughs> around the farm. Now the secret is birthday control pills. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> I always thought Reagan was taking birthday control pills back in his days, of the, or, or Clinton. But, you, you know, if you focus on it, like people get an idea, well, I can't do this because I'm old. I take a lady to lunch who will be 102 in September. She was the greatest rider of her generation. There was no question she was. She won the medal of clay and all these horse things. She still rides. She's, a, she's 101 now, and she's blind. So she goes out on a lead line. So she's on level ground, but she still rides. So I don't want to hear how you can't do something. You can do it. it. You might be slow. It might hurt, but you can do it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're going to end. We want to thank you, but we're going to be in the back um, signing books, saying hello. There is some really yummy cake uh, from Molly's Cupcakes in the back, and they're beautiful covers, but I see my sister's cutting them, uh, so you might not see our book covers on the cakes. <laughs> but thank you all, really, for coming tonight. Thank Appreciate you, Felice. It. Thank you.